We've signed a variety of commercial contracts that show the density of our economic ties. Some contracts in the defense industry, contracts on armament, a highly anticipated contract on exploiting and maintaining the Doha Metro and the Lusail Tramway. Also some important contracts on soil depollution. In total, we've signed agreements worth about $14 billion, which shows the intensity of our relation. Our senior business producer Mobin Nasser was in Doha recently and got a first-hand look at how those rail projects are progressing. Filled with cranes, trucks and crews, Doha is a city under construction. Its population is rising quickly and five years from now, an explosion of visitors is expected when Qatar hosts the Football World Cup. So the government is spending tens of billions of dollars on new railway projects. Uh, the first one is the Doha Metro uh, project, which is by far the, the largest. Uh, the second one, it is the uh, Lusail uh, light rail uh, tram. Uh, the third one, uh, it used to be the long distance for connecting the logistics and industrial hubs with the port inside Qatar and also with the GCC uh, countries. The Doha Metro project will initially span 80 kilometers and 37 stations. As its network expands, this tally will eventually reach 100 stations. Most of the project is being built underground and Doha has set a world record for the highest number of tunnel boring machines deployed at the same time in a city. Similar sized projects in other parts of the world took an average of 20 years to build. But this subway is expected to be functional within five years from the start of construction. The chief executive of Qatar Rail explains what's behind this urgency. Qatar economy is losing 1 or 2 percent just because of the traffic. The opportunity from the Med Doha Metro is that extra lanes can be converted to a pavement area, to a planting uh, area. We can make landscape, we can make green areas. Prototypes of the new trains are kept at this mock station. It offers a preview of what commuters can expect. These electric trains can reach speeds of up to 100 km per hour. They're driverless and passengers can ride shotgun. And unlike most other countries, the subway here has separate sections for women and children. Uh, privacy is ensured in this class. There is a special features on this class. We have the children's seat. And then there's the VIP section for those who want to travel in style. The gold class designed uh, for seated uh, passengers uh, and it's really comfortable. Every passenger has uh, his own seat, uh, his own screen and uh, the interior fittings is very unique. Crews are racing to complete construction of Qatar Rail at dozens of sites in Doha and other parts of the country. That means traffic jams are more common nowadays and commuters are winding through detours. But once this project is complete, it could mean a smooth drive for Qatar to the 2022 World Cup and beyond. Rubin Nasser, TRT World, Doha. And Mobin's back from Doha and with us here in the studio. Hello, Mobin. Um, yeah, Doha traffic, know all about it. How Been about there, that VIP that. section? VIP section <laughs> on the metro, my goodness. That's how they um, do it in Qatar. That's how they roll, literally. Um, look, a lot of the infrastructure that you pointed out there uh, is being geared for the World Cup. But what happens after that? Is it going to fall into disrepair, as we've seen in so many other big sporting venues? And that was a question that we brought up again and again with officials. Look, we know that at least one of the stadiums, the Rasa Abu Abud Stadium, 
massive, by the way, 40,000 seater, is made entirely out of repurposed um, modified containers, it can be taken apart and soak in all the seats, bathroom stalls inside. Uh, and also talking to the Green Building Council chairman, uh, he says that all infrastructure projects, and not just those geared towards the World Cup, are being encouraged to, to use uh, environmentally friendly materials, recycled materials. And of course, uh, talking to the architect of the tourism strategy, he says that sports tourism is a big part of the future for Qatar. We know they're heavily invested in football. Uh, the investment fund, the, the QIA, owns Paris Saint-Germain. Uh, Qatar Airways is a major, or in fact, main sponsor of Barcelona. Aspire owns talent agencies and uh, academies throughout the world. So they're hoping to uh, have more football games in the future as well. And then, of course, there's the other sports, the equestrian club, for instance. They're trying really hard to create more global events uh, for Arabian horses and bring their demand up to par with thoroughbreds. Uh, so clearly, they, are, they have many plans beyond uh, the World Cup for utilizing sports infrastructure. Um, we've also mentioned that Qatar is buying billions of worth of dollars from, uh, of planes from France. Who else is it reaching out to uh, now that this blockade is in place? So we've reported on the, the deal with uh, Turkey and with Iran. We've also seen imports rising not just from Turkey and Iran, but also from places like India and Pakistan. Uh, and of course, they have already moved to ease access for people with uh, visa-free access for 80 countries. And now they say, uh, officials there are saying that they want to do similar things for uh, goods and services and for companies, especially they've earmarked uh, what they are calling primary markets, uh, like India, like the United States, the UK, France. Uh, and they want to create uh, an environment where they can register businesses faster, bid for uh, new contracts faster. And of course, then there's the aspect of localization. Uh, what they want to do, for instance, at the Hamad port, they're building packaging uh, facilities. So the idea is that at least some of these projects that are uh, brought in from abroad, at least the value addition can then take place within the country, thus driving more jobs uh, and also keeping some of that foreign exchange within the country. Mervin Nasser, thank you very much indeed.